We've heard OTT, social, all these different kinds of buzzwords thrown in throughout the day. Everyone's kind of had their opinions on it. These are the guys that are actually uh, down in the front lines doing this stuff for their respective companies uh, day in and day out. Uh, and one of the uh, reasons why it's fun to talk about uh, the digital side of things uh, and uh, Clark, I'll, I'll uh, quote uh, a colleague of yours, uh, Mark Pesavento, who says it's fun to be in digital because you get to quote try shit, and uh, he says that's what makes it fun, and I'm sure that's what makes it fun for these guys. So on that note, to kind of open the conversation, and we'll uh, uh, start here on the left with you, Dave. What's something that you tried this year uh, that you think was a big success, or something that you're most particularly proud of? So we've been. It's on. Is it? You guys hear me? There you go. So we've been experimenting a lot in the virtual reality space. Um, in fact, we were the first uh, league to live stream an actual game in virtual reality, the opening game uh, for the Warriors with the ring ceremony. And we've actually been experimenting in virtual reality for a couple of years now with various different vendors, and the productions keep getting better and better. So we're really excited about that. I mean, one of, the, one of our tenets is we want to bring every fan courtside, and from the technology that I've seen, nothing does that the same way virtual reality does. So I guess there's still questions about what the business models are going to be and whether you know, they're going to be able to do something so that it doesn't give you a headache when you have those clunky uh, glasses on. Um, but if you've ever seen it, even if you know, some of the demos they show is just like a ship going through the ocean, just really mundane things, and it's incredible. So if you haven't seen an NBA game uh, in, in virtual reality, it's something really to behold. So that's something we're definitely keeping a close eye on and we think holds a lot of promise for the future. That's very cool. Uh, William, William Mao is with uh, MP and Silva. William, you kind of split your year between uh, YouTube and MP and Silva, so feel free to pick from either of your career exploits. Uh, in terms of something... Something, 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 yeah, something you tried this year um, that you're proud of. I would say that, uh, at least at Silva, we, the company has traditionally been a, a broker of linear media rights uh, around the world, and, and being uh, one of the um, few individuals that they brought on over the last uh, 18 to 24 months to try to figure out, okay, what can we do beyond our bread and butter business, and really getting to build that from the ground up at the company has, has been really exciting. I call it uh, being the, uh, the lighthouse keeper, or the lighthouse uh, for a fishery that's only been you know, fishing in, in, in one, one area for a long time, and they see this tidal wave coming out, 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 you know, 40 miles out, and my job is to keep waving my hands and, and saying, look, there's things coming, there's things coming, um, we, should, we should prepare, and, uh, you know, being, a, I guess, a lighthouse or a lighthouse keeper has been pretty fun. Cool. Uh, Sandy, it's been an exciting year for you guys at One World Sports with uh, various different properties coming on board, but was there anything in particular you guys tried this year that you were particularly interested in? Of, uh, of international sports from the KHL uh, to Chelsea, Arsenal, Bayern Munich, um, uh, it's the Asian Football Confederation, um, the Chinese Basketball Association, um, and then here domestically, the NASL, the New York Cosmos. And one of the things we did with the AFC back last uh, January is we created a, a microsite uh, around the uh, AFC Cup, uh, the AFC Championship, which happens every four years and uh, live streamed it up in Canada. And we were actually quite, we, we couldn't live stream it here because we operate, uh, as Chris Bedwalker was talking about, we are an authenticated model, but we did it up in Canada. And we we're actually very pleasantly surprised at the number of people that actually got onto the site and, and watched all the games. Clark, I can't, uh, I don't know what you're gonna pick from because you guys did so much cool stuff with Fox Sports 1 this year, but what's, what were you particularly proud of? From a, from a Fox Sports Go perspective, I, I think, uh, there were a bunch of things. Around the Women's World Cup, we did a, a whole bunch of different bonus feeds that supported the linear broadcast as well as the, the simulcast of the linear broadcast within Fox Sports Go. So there was, there was a, you know, a lot of that. We continue to add a lot of um, you know, non-linear events to Fox Sports Go as well. Um, you know, we doubled up what we did with the Big East Digital Network this, from last year to this year. And we're, you know, we just did a deal with the National Lacrosse League, which is professional indoor lacrosse. I know you'll all be watching. And by the way, I'm impressed that this many people are that close to a cocktail and are in here. So I just <laughs> thought I'd share that. Um, so I, I think the big thing for us this year was the bonus feeds, though, because it's something that we saw and we really learned a lot from doing it. And then we've done it, obviously, this year. We've done it with the Champions League on each match day. We're offering 
you know, a, a ton of those, four per, per match that we're doing on Fox Sports Go as well as on Fox Soccer Go. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big growth area for us, and we see a lot of, um, a lot of usage on that side. That's great. Uh, well, if we're talking about OTT, which has come up a lot throughout the last couple of days, uh, there may be a little bit of hesitation where there's a feeling that OTT is somehow a, a threat to the traditional linear model, but a lot of you are kind of sitting in a position where the purpose of what you're doing is to help drive more to your linear television products. Um, it, it, your digital team at the NBA does a lot of li live real-time highlights, and they say, if anything, it drives more tune-ins to the games when they know things are going on. Uh, Clark, I know you've always said what you guys are doing is meant to be a complement to what's going on on the television side. Uh, uh, David, we'll start with you. Uh, do you think that's still uh, a, a, something you have to preach a little bit and say, whoa, whoa, we're not here to take your fans away we're working towards the same thing here yeah I mean absolutely at the end of the day you know our bread is buttered by our national television contract so everything we do is in support of those we don't do anything that's going to take away from that in fact everything we do on social media ultimately or not everything but just about everything has a tune-in messaging mm -hmm. for for our national games and our regional partner games on Fox and, and Comcast so we're, we're very focused on uh, the, the fact that our national media is of paramount importance, but by the same token, we're out there, you know, probably more than any other league, experimenting mm -hmm. in these various spaces, whether it's Snapchat, you know, Twitter, Vine. Um, I just read a stat uh, today about, so we passed a billion loops on Vine, uh, and the biggest uh, loop of all is a LeBron uh, full-court shot that he took in a practice uh, at the Boston Garden uh, <laughs> Arena. So. It's, you know, it's just different content resonates in different places, so we are, you know, out there testing everything, but at the end of the day, we know, you know, we want to do everything in support of our national uh, telecast partners. Well, it was a little different with you working with international rights holders of um, Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it, we, we think of the non, I think linear, I think we all agree that linear is still the core of the business. I think um, there was some report that came out, an article recently that said, the, the market value of, of linear rights was 150 billion, and with all the millions and billions of viewers that are going uh, on mobile and cutting cords and, and doing doing all that, um, I think the so over the top in the online space was still only two billion, right? So we're talking about a 75x difference. So I think the dollars may still the dollars are still on the linear side as the audience may be gravitating towards towards the online space. Well, on, on in our business, it's, it's oftentimes trying to use over the top or, or non-linear as an, a way to grow audience for a particular league internationally. So you may not be able to get Malaysian volleyball distributed out in Romania on television, but you can go direct to the consumer and target a whole bunch of different territories at once. And in some cases, we've actually used it to demonstrate that there is a market in a territory. Um, over the summer, we had um, renegotiations with the domestic broadcasters in the Nordic region for La Liga, the Spanish uh, soccer league, and you know they were bogging down a little bit, and we wanted one price, and they weren't willing to pay it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we said, okay, the season's about to kick off. We're going to go over the top. We're going to go direct to the consumer. We work with one of our technology partners, EverSport. And for the first couple weekends, we put those games on over the top through an SBOD model, just to demonstrate that look, your viewers want to watch this. Your market wants to watch this content, and ultimately, I think that did help drive, uh, you know, to a closure on the deal on the linear side as well. Yeah, Sandy, multi-platform distribution has kind of been the core of One World Sports since the gate, since the day you guys started, day one. So, how do you guys kind of uh, let each other, let each side complement each other? I should say. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, we we when we buy rights where, when we can, we we get every uh, we get every medium we we possibly can muster, um, and we uh, we're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand. We, um, you know, we operate in an authenticated environment, so we stream that way. Um, you know, we try to use clip rights where we can to be able to try to build a brand. We're an emerging network. You know, we don't have, we're, we're not a league, so we don't have that uh, flexibility uh, as much as we'd like. But we do what we can based upon the, the rights that we have available to us. And it is all about, at this particular juncture, even though we're in, in front of 30 million homes, we're still trying to drive our brand and we'll continue to drive our brand, uh, you know, forever. Um, so the more that we can do over the top to be, that will allow us to be able to do that, then that's, you know, that's what we're going to do at the same time respecting the relationships that we maintain with all, our, all of our MVPDs, which at the end of the day are paramount to our growth. And Clark, what's the philosophy at a big linear broadcaster like Fox when it comes to uh, digital? 
Yeah, Fox Sports Go is there to support uh, you know what we do on the linear side, and it's there to support what we do with our league partners and, and you know everybody that we're in we're business with. And having said that, we also have direct to consumer products. I mean, most paramount is Fox Soccer to go. So we you know in a, on a regular match day with the UEFA Champions League, uh, you know there'll be five matches that are not on TV. So we put those five matches, make them available over the top through. Uh, Fox Soccer to go, and it's a nice little business that just hums along kind of quietly in the corner. So, uh, you know, we're we're on both sides, and there's some experimentation that we've done with Fox Soccer to go to, to understand, uh, you know, what's out there. But, you know, to follow up on what William said, I mean, it, it, you're a passionate fan, and you know, I think what I see is it just getting a little more niche, you know, especially in these niche, uh, you know, these niche opportunities. That's why I'm excited about our relationship you know, our current relationship with the Big East and what we do with them with the Big East Digital Network and I mentioned before the NLL. It'll be interesting to see what we can do, uh, you know, with a product like that that we can promote through what we do normally on the linear side and then bring it into a, you know, it's essentially it's not over the top, but it's available unauthenticated because you know, right. it's not on TV. Now, you've talked a little bit about it and bonus feeds is a big a feature of Fox Sports Go. You did it during the Women's World Cup. You're seeing it now through Champions League and, and a little bit on a couple of uh, key college events, like you mentioned, the first football game with Michigan and Utah, the Big Ten Championship game. Um, what is what is your biggest challenge right now? Is it that last mile, uh, and not to get too technical here, but is it how hard is it to do a real-time complimentary experience when it, there's might not be great sync there? The, the sync is tough. That, that is the biggest consumer complaint, mm -hmm. no question about it. The biggest issue that we face is just bandwidth. It's just getting bandwidth you know, at a remote site, especially with college football. We were only able to do it on some of our bigger games where we had available bandwidth. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a very straightforward thing. And it doesn't, you know, the beauty of it is, is that we're not in the way of the production. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that's something that was important to us is to design a solution that, that kept, uh, and having grown up on the production side, I understand all those little gremlins that just make you crazy. So we, we tried really hard to stay away from that. We designed a way to do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it definitely works, but bandwidth is the, is the hardest part. You know, and, and we want to get to 60 frames, uh, you know, per second. We want to increase the, the, the video quality, and those things are just going to need more bandwidth. So that's the biggest thing for us, especially when we're in an arena, we're only at once. Mm -hmm. You know, so then we got to call Verizon and do a six-month contract, and, you know. Right, right. <laughs> usually don't get those approved. Uh, Dave, going to kind of to get into, uh, uh, you guys had a couple of interest, intriguing deals this year. One of the ones that you came out with this year was e you kind of reformulated the NBA League Pass subscription process. Uh, while uh, maybe traditional cable providers are can you keep the bundle together, you guys literally ha gave fans the option to fraction it off into individual games uh, and for individual teams. Uh, how has that gone for you, and how has it been received, and what kind of challenges maybe has it prevented you or presented you, if any? It's actually been tremendous, quite honestly. I mean, um, we, our mantra and the commissioner's mantra is, you know, we need to give the fans what they want, where they want it. So we definitely, those of us on the business side of the traditional league pass business, had some trepidation about offering these additional packages. So this year, for the first time, we're the first league to offer a ability to buy single game SKUs, uh, a follow your team pass, and then we have the traditional full league pass, um, all at different price points, obviously. Um, we did expect some cannibalization. Quite frankly, we haven't seen it. In fact, we've seen growth. And I think, you know, part of that is stoking the interest of maybe the more casual fan who's going to go buy a single game who might not want to spend 200 bucks to get the, the full league pass. Or, you know, the transplanted Nick fan living in L.A. that just wants to follow the Knicks and not necessarily have, you know, a thousand games. So I think it, it's been great. Um, the linear uh, distributors don't have the same flexibility, although they have the ability to offer, we gave them the right to offer those similar packages. They don't uh, quite have that flexibility yet, but even there, we haven't seen any cannibalization at this point. We've, we've seen growth there as well. So we've been tremendously pleased uh, with the product this year. Um, you know, we're, we're continuing to see growth. Uh, we get reports every day, and we're, you know, selling more packages every day. So we'll see how it goes. We're, we're still obviously early in the process, but so far it's, it's been outstanding. Yeah, you said you, you are pleased with it. You can be honest. Were you surprised at all? Was anyone surprised? Was there any hesitancy? Or, or? I, absolutely. I mean, personally, I, I was surprised. I was uh -huh. expecting, you know, I was one of the people maybe not wanting to go out there with all the packages at <laughs> right. once. But, uh, 
you know, again, the, the mantra is we need to be able to give people, you know, what they want and, and bring some more casual fans in the tent. Traditionally, League Pass has been, you know, for the hardcore fan that wants a thousand games. And the way we've looked at that is that's a lot of waste. Nobody's watching, you know, a thousand games. So um, do you give people the ability? You know, we've talked about a monthly pass or other potential options. But um, what we came out with, we did a lot of research uh, over the summer and we decided to launch the packages that I mentioned. And yeah, I've definitely been surprised um, at the fact that our overall business has, has grown, not shrunk, as a result of that. Yeah, you know, um, this could be for any of you to take, but William, I'll start it with you. Um, I, to kind of play off of that, I know that when you're working in the digital space, there can be this crippling fear to charge for anything. Um, but if you listen to what you know, Bob Oman was saying earlier today during his keynote, is that if you trust the content, even God forbid, even millennials will pay for things. Uh, uh, do, do you find that to be true? And how do you kind of deal with, uh, you know, someone in your team or someone, a client you're working with who goes, well, if we charge, then no one will watch it and will disappear. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think, you know, char charging, uh, for me personally, it's, it's that much of like a third rail mm -hmm. uh, in the situation. I think everyone charging roughly the same price, like $10 for any, any channel, which is kind of what the market is kind of doing right now, at least domestically, mm -hmm. is probably not the best way to go. Um, but I think there has to be an understanding that on, on the digital side, you're, if you're going to kind of remove that carriage fee piece of the puzzle, that you can't make it up entirely on a, on a subscription fee. You're going to have to do a little bit of subscription. You're going to have to find a way to better monetize it by integrating brands and, and actually making the content itself by nature more valuable and, and monetized in different ways. And hopefully A plus B plus C is more than the A plus B we're getting with the carriage and the advertising. Um, obviously, right now, given the, the numbers, it's not fully there yet. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily a, a huge issue to charge. Uh, to, to the point of, of it, you know, at the end of the day, especially if it's bundled around some really compelling live content, people are going to pay for it. Um, and, and so charging isn't that big a deal in my mind. Mm -hmm. Sandy, what do you think about that? Well, look, we're a content company. So uh, in, in the sports business, you've got to generate revenue any way you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would never be able to operate off of one revenue stream. I mean, look, we, um, you know, we obviously are, uh, you know, first and foremost, a linear network. Um, that actually skews heavily millennial, and we, so we generate our subscription fees that way. But we also realize there's a four and a half billion dollar digital advertising market just for sports uh, out there, and so we're you know actively uh, developing that market again, given the fact that we you know the network does skew millennial um, in terms of being able to develop content that goes after that. At such time when we're in a position where we'll have the ability to do more in terms of you know, charging subscription fees and, you know, other areas, then we're certainly going to take a look at that. But again, as a content company, it's incumbent upon us to look under every rock we possibly can to be able to generate some sort of fee growth. Clark, when you were kind of going through that transition of Fox Soccer was becoming Fox Sports 1, and now you've still got Fox Soccer to go in the background, was there any hesitancy about charging for Fox Soccer to go, or did you think that that was a niche that was big enough that, you know, they are going to want to watch it? Yeah, there, there was no hesitancy. It, like I said, it's a it's a nice little business that just you know mm -hmm. hums away in the corner there. Um, you know, we don't promote it too broadly, but fans find the content. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it, and it works really well. On the on the Fox Sports Go side, you know, we're we're it's the exact opposite, right? We're you know we're doing everything to support the linear linear side. One of the things that we worked on this year, as far as bringing in revenue, is and we started it with the Women's World Cup is using these engagement ads uh, through a, a company we acquired called Truex, uh, and they were driving at a much higher CPM, and we were able to, you know, really get some great data uh, that we could use and we could also share with our, with our sponsors, but also, it, you know, it was amazing how many people engaged with that ad. Uh, so that was something that we learned a lot about and that we're, we're working on ways to, to improve and sort of, you know, the rights have already been paid for on the linear side, so I'm not worried about the rights fees, yeah. but we are worried about monetizing it, and we need to show some, you know, some engagement. You know, the engagement data is showing, and it's starting to illustrate the vast difference between a digital approach versus a traditional linear approach. Mm -hmm. And I would say that you have to be willing to, to test and learn when it comes to the price. And I think that's what mm -hmm. what David and the NBA are doing, right? With these different packages, is actually putting four data points out in the market in a given year and seeing what the pickup is. Whereas before, it was okay. We have a 9.99 product. 
and I guess this many people paid. So I guess people were willing to pay for that, but you have no idea whether they, you would have more people pay if it was $7.99 or $5.99 or what. And that's traditionally, I mean, take, take business models that work from other industries, like the banking industry. They change your interest rate all the time on your checking, your saving, your brokerage account. And they do that to get data, different data points to understand your demand as a consumer and your willingness to pay. And I think you know, it's really smart to, to go out actually with multiple offers and, and try to construct the elasticity of it, if, if you will. I would, I would just one, one second. I would also say just it also has to do with the content that you've got. Sure. Because I think you know, when all the Disney content ends up going to Netflix next year, I don't think you're going to be seeing them charging nine <laughs> bucks a month. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, we should raise the rates based on when we have Manchester United, Manchester City, right? And then we can lower them for Swansea. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> just to echo Sandy's point about the content, I mean, one of the things we did to buttress the value of, of League Pass, so Steve Helmuth over there built a high-speed arena network, so we're getting every feed in from every game. So we're offering home and away feeds, so if you want to watch your home announcers, you can do that. We offer an archive of all the games. Um, we offer, you know, Spanish language feeds. So there's, there's a lot we've done to try to improve the value of the, of the package to, to make the content better. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been brought up quite, through quite a few of the other panels throughout today, and that's uh, virtual reality. Uh, I don't know where you guys see that maybe fitting in your space, and I think it's worth mentioning uh, there's a distinct difference between what you might consider virtual reality and what are these 360-degree videos that might just be popping up on Facebook that you're seeing right now. We're like, oh, I'm flying by the Star Destroyer in Star Wars. Hey, uh, not necessarily something you're putting up to your face. Uh, so obviously, so where exactly does that fit in your department? Is that something that you guys who are more of, are probably more directly tied to the linear side than maybe your social media teams may be, where does that kind of fall in the organization's pecking order, would you say? Anyone can help in there. For, I mean, on a, on a Fox Sports side, we're, we're actually, on the digital and linear, we're attached to the hip on VR. I mean, okay. we're, we're, doing, we're doing a lot of testing and, um, and speaking to a lot of companies about that. Uh, and we're, we're really interested in what the New York Times is doing with Google Cardboard. There's some mm -hmm. other things. I, I think there's a big opportunity in the short term with, with highlights. And I think clearly digital distribution is going to be able to get to people a lot sooner than the living room. Mm -hmm. There's just too many hurdles with the... The sets, set top boxes, and the you know the MVPDs in general. I think we can get there a lot quicker with with uh, you know the right handset with with the, the proper amount of pixels. So um, we're we're knee deep into it, and there's some interesting things that are going on in that space for sure. You know, one area which I don't, which I will say up here uh, here in the United States, we don't do enough of is on the advertising front. Is a lot of virtual advertising. Sure. Um, you see a lot of it in Mexico. I certainly saw it at Univision with Televisa. Uh, PVI, and um, and I think that there's a, that's a, a great opportunity here that we haven't taken advantage of, and I think certainly from someone a network like ours, it's an area that we're going to be spending a lot more time in in 2016. Um, I would say that I think even if the the future state of VR were simply that, um, in addition to a you know the New York Knicks being able to sell their courtside seats for you know multiple thousands of dollars per <laughs> per game. Um, they were also then able to sell on an infinite uh, looping basis that same seat through a VR device for a season pass um, for, you know, 20% of that price, but be able to sell it uh, thousands and thousands of times per game. Um, and then using that to increase the advertising value because you're going to see the same advertisements you would see as if you were still in the venue and drive up the sponsorship value. Even if that was the, the reality of, of VR, I, I would be very bullish on it. I just think... And I think this was something uh, Chris Bevelco brought up. I don't think the infrastructure is there yet, right? Like, you don't have hundreds and thousands of people with these devices yet, and the pricing on the, on the devices in and of themselves uh, is still pretty high. I don't think, I think David would agree that, you know, leak pass probably wouldn't work if, you know, you didn't have these phone plans where the phone roughly was, you know, tens of dollars because you were locked in for a X couple of years and everyone still had to buy their, their phone for, you know, $500, $600 and there wasn't this market of people that had mobile phones in their pockets. Yeah, I agree with William. I mean, as I said before, we're very active out there experimenting in this space and we have some of our teams. The Lakers are going to do a, a VR broadcast uh, this month. The Kings did one in, in India for a school that Vivek, the owner, went to. Um, in India, so we're definitely out there actively experimenting, but you know, we all remember what happened with 3D. Everybody said that was going to be you know, the next big thing, and that didn't materialize, so it, it remains to be seen. It is, it's very cool, there's no question, and we think we're very well positioned to take advantage of it if the technology does 
catch on, but I, I think that remains to be seen. Now, the other future-facing technology that might be more prevalent to you guys than even VR might be 4K. Everyone says, well, 4K is going to happen. It's going to be over the top first. It's going to be Netflix doing it, or it's going to, you know, there's companies like uh, you guys at the NBA have worked with New Lion on uh, uh, testing some of these things out. Uh, so do you guys feel like you're on the front lines of 4K right now? And are you seriously looking at opportunities as we're probably going through a holiday season where even if people don't realize it, they're probably going to be getting some 4K sets under their Christmas trees or Hanukkah menorahs or whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's definitely, we're experimenting with everything, including 4K. We've done some testing and, you know, we'll continue to do that. But I think that's going to be more, frankly, driven by our network partners and, and you know, what they do. Because ultimately, um, you know, I don't know that this is going to be a, a league pass driven thing. This would mm -hmm. be more driven by uh, what the networks uh, want to do. And ultimately, whether, you know, are the, are the sets going to be out there and people going to have them? And are there going to be enough events produced in the technology to, to make sense? Well, I mean, the seating arrangement is also perfect for this particular question because as an agency, that's kind of usually the, the broker between the rights the rights originator, the rights holder, and then we help them distribute and then sell it to the distributing platforms all around the world. From our perspective, I think we're, we're kind of going to wait and see on how, on how 4K is being defi uh, defined from a rights perspective. Is it kind of from a contractual legal perspective lumped in with the same sort of linear or the same digital rights that have already been granted in existing agreements? Or are they going to write something more prescriptive about it that carves it out as something new that is not, you know, sort of implied in the existing rights deals? I think that's the conversation that's going to be had between folks on my left and folks on my right. So we carry all the Yomiuri Giants games out of Japan uh, exclusively. And, you know, we've had some tangential conversations with them about 4K, and we all know um, sort of what the... Uh, Olympics situation is going to be there in a few years. Um, and so that's something that we're certainly keeping our eye on. I mean, I think one of the things, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, actually David would know this um, from the perspective of the amount of content that comes overseas uh, that's in HD. I mean, we made this progression from SD to HD. Um, and I think most of the content that we're seeing that comes in, again, we carry everything that goes on our air for the most part is comes from overseas, uh, is very good quality HD. So then you make the next progression to 4K, um, and it is something that, you know, obviously it's incumbent upon us to be able to give the best experience to our viewers that we possibly can. And, uh, you know, we are taking a look at that. We, we produce all the New York Cosmos games. You know, we've taken a look at that in terms of, you know, production costs, and it's probably two and a half times, uh, you know, what we, you know, normally would, would spend on producing a you know a regular game, so obviously that you know that has an impact too as we look at what we do in terms of original production. Distribution. I mean, who, who's going to distribute it, right? And, yeah. You know, and, and the ecosystem into the fan to the living room. Uh, you know, I having gone through the SD to HD world on the production side, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure we didn't get extra sub fees when we started launching channels in HD. <laughs> But the big box stores and the Samsungs and the Vizios of the world made a lot of money on that deal. So there's a reason 3D didn't happen. You know, we, we didn't foot the bill, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, look, it, it, I think we're at the same place. If, if, if they want it, you know, they've got to pay for the content to be produced. And, and then, you know, people have to make the investment to be able to, to, to see that content. But, you know, I keep hearing 8K and then, you know, my colleague Brad Cheney was up here earlier talking about 16K. I mean, I know it was a little bit in jest, but, you know, where... You know, where, where do we stop? I mean, we it, it just, look, I, I still walk into people's family rooms where they have SD channels stretched and they think that's HD. Okay, so it, my mom it, there's an it. education process that still hasn't taken place and still hasn't resonated with the consumer. Um, you know, I guess at the end of the day, the big box, they don't really care as long as they buy the set and, you know, they move the product, right? But, you know, I, I think on the digital side, we have a unique opportunity to distribute this content. Uh, you know, so th there might be a way to do it there, I think, a lot sooner. But, you know, to build a 4K truck, roll it around the country, do specific events, you know, there's a cost to that. Mm -hmm. So who's paying the cost and how are we going to distribute it? Of course. Uh, we got about 10 minutes left with these gentlemen. Any questions from the audience? Crickets. All right. Uh, David, uh, the Verizon Go90. Uh, 
deal. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. That just that's only a couple of months old now, if that. Um, so uh, how are you guys? Uh, you know, we hear a lot about this that mobile is taking over. Everyone's saying you know X number percentage of our uh, you know whatever is coming from mobile. Um, so what have you guys seen in the early goings? Yeah, I mean it's really just launching now. The the Go90 um, well the platform launched a couple months ago, but our content is is just launching now. So uh, what we're doing is we have kind of several channels on the free version of Go90. So we're going to have uh, some cut down games. We're going to have some uh, exclusive content from our NBA TV talent. Uh, we're going to have some, you know, uh, mic'd up features showing the, the player wireless microphone access uh, features that we gather. Um, and then, you know, it was important to Verizon to, so they have a stable of YouTube influencers and whether it's Awesomeness TV or, or whoever, and they want to, so we want to have some content that looks at our traditional content from a non-traditional lens. So whether it's a Awesomeness TV talent, you know, voicing our top 10 uh, or, or things like that. We're going to experiment and, and see what works on mobile. Um, and then in addition, they're going to be launching League Pass, a, a mobile-only platform for League Pass, which is going to be really interesting. Um, that's probably uh, still a month or so away. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But um, they're very excited about that, as are we. Again, just to see the learnings. Obviously, we have our own League Pass um, direct-to-consumer product out there that's available on, on digital and mobile. But this is going to be within the Go90 platform mobile only. So I think it's, it's too early to know right now, but um, there was a lot of demand by them for our content, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, we're definitely interested to see how that plays out. William, you're nodding your head with the mobile first. Uh, how does that kind of play into how you're working with your clients? Um, I think it's a, it's a combination of, of education. I think there's still um, a lot of markets um, that aren't as, as developed as the U.S., obviously. And so um, in, in terms of just educating them and saying, hey, you know what? you need to kind of ride the oncoming wave, not sit on the one that you're, you're, you've been riding for a while. Um, but there are other markets like in Asia where um, places like Korea and, and India are very mobile first. And so oftentimes, uh, in China as well, um, and so oftentimes when we're going to market with content, we actually may go to a, a distributor that is um, more mobile first actually before we go the traditional route in, in some cases. And that's just going where the eyeballs are. Uh, I want to switch the conversation a little bit here Lou, from what we've been doing this year and what's been exciting so far to what we're looking forward to in 2016 after we get back from the holidays, New Year and everything. Uh, Clark, uh, we've said it, I've said it before in conversations with you, 2015 really felt like a breakout year for uh, Fox Sports Go. Uh, so what are you guys uh, looking forward to in 2016? What are some things that you might be uh, experimenting with? 2016, uh, there's a, a lot going on in 2016. I mean, we're, we will have a Super Bowl uh, in, in early 2017, and then we'll also have the um, uh, three FIFA events, 17, 18, and 19. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of our focus right now is on those, on those four events. Uh, so we're trying to, you know, we're looking into that. We'll, we'll have another uh, U.S. Open golf championship in, in June. So we're looking forward to getting onto a normal golf course um, where we won't get ripped for everything we can't control. Um, <laughs> you know, they are listening. That's great. Um, <laughs> So, it, it, you know, it's it, it just kind of, we're just kind of rolling along. I mean, we talked about 4K, we talked about VR. I mean, you know, those are things that we're, we're uh, you know, we're, we're involved with at this point. Uh, but, you know, really looking, looking into the future, uh, you know, with some of our bigger FIFA events and, uh, and the next, uh, um, uh, you know, the next uh, U.S. Open. Sandy, what's the, uh, some next big steps, you think, for One World? Well, I mean, given where we are, it's really all about distribution. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've cut a wide swath in 2015, and we're hopeful of cutting a bigger one in 2016. I mean, as we look at our content, um, we get started, obviously, uh, with the KHL and the CHL, and then we roll into the Joe Muri Giants. Um, we uh, will then conclude with uh, Chelsea, Arsenal, Bayern Munich, and Juventus. Then we pick up the, uh, the NASL and the English Cricket Board, um, and then uh, and we continue through the NASL into the fall um, and the One Asia Golf Tour, um, all the while filling in with the ITTF and the BWF. And so, we, you know, seasonality is something we don't have on the network, and so we, we um, you know, we pride ourselves in that. So it's really, you know, adding more content. And then the other side of it is really just trying to expand our digital presence and really trying to go after that $4.5 billion advertising market I mentioned earlier. 
um, that's going to be very important to us. And I think digital is going to be a very, very part, big part of our focus in next year. That's great. William, now you got, what, five, six, seven months under your belt now at MP? Yeah. So you're pretty, um, pretty comfortable now, so what are you looking forward to? I would to? say, as a company, um, one of the things that we're working on that's being driven out of our region, and there's been a lot of press about it, is um, one of our, our majority owners uh, wants to launch a new soccer league in the Americas, and so all hands on deck for that. It's a uh, UEFA Champions League for North and South America. So uh, just Google that, and I'm sure you'll, you'll find some articles about it. Um, but me personally, I, I want to drive our business towards an empty warehouse or an empty cupboard uh, or an empty freezer, if you, if you want to call it, in terms of not just selling you know, the live rights and then making you know, 90, 90, 95% of our business is still going to be that. But then you know, how can we package what's, what's still there and what's what's left over and, and realize new value, right? So whether it's finding value for archive content, continue to find more and more value for uh, short form clip content as there's this pressure from the bottom of, of driving value on the social media side as well. Um, and then one, one piece that, that is uh, not sort of germane to the US just given the laws we have here is uh, trying to further develop our, our betting rights portfolio. We're one of the biggest uh, distributors of the, the betting rights and the betting feeds that go into the, uh, the betting houses in, in the UK, for example, on the high street. So um, trying to get more and more content that can be piped through that, that betting uh, funnel as well. Yeah, I would say globalization, frankly. I mean, it's something we've been focused on for a while. Um, and it's, it's amazing since I've been at the NBA, the, the amount we've grown globally. We're now televising games in about 220 countries, something like that. And you know, even just the way we're distributing content there. So I've, I've talked about League Pass mostly as a domestic product, but League Pass is actually a huge international business for us, the very similar product available internationally um, with some, some minor uh, differences. Uh, one of the things being, you know, how we present our content to the international fans. So one of the things uh, we launched sort of quietly last year and we're doing full-fledged this year is what we call continuous feed. So instead of the normal commercial breaks, uh, that, you know, if you're sitting in Russia watching a game, you're going to get the feed from in arena. So most people in Russia may not ever make it to an NBA game, but they're going to get to experience, whether it's the dance team, the guy balancing plates on his head, whatever it is. And it, it's been, you know, great so far. So, um, and in that same vein, we're also looking in terms of our, you know, foreign destination websites, you know, localized content. That's the, the mantra at NBA Entertainment right now. How do we target content that's relevant um, for each particular region rather than just, you know, sending out the games and, you know, NBA action, one of our shows, to everywhere. We're trying to pick, okay, you know, France has a different consumer than, you know, Spain and has a different consumer than China. So we're really trying to target content for the particular audience and really develop fans uh, to consume more content ultimately. Yeah, you guys have been doing a really good job of that. Your colleague, Mike Allen, uh, was telling us about a story of uh, Halloween weekend Steph Curry went off for, I think, 53 points or something like that. Tony Parker had a six-point game, which at this point is career, in his career, I guess, is good for him. Uh, in France, the Tony Parker video got significantly more views. The six-point Tony Parker highlight got more views than the 53-point Steph Curry highlight video. found that incredibly uh, interesting. Yeah. 